We all want to see the future, don't we? Personally, I am in a bit of a confusing season. There seem to be doors and windows of opportunity constantly being opened and closed before me. And the ability to peer through time and space to see how things are going to shake out would give my mind some much needed rest. And I know I'm not alone in feeling that way. For centuries, human beings have done some very strange things to try and get a peek at what the future may bring. My name is Josh, and you're listening to Obscure History. Since the beginning of human history, people have tried their best to look forward into the future, and the methods that developed are almost as diverse as the human race itself. The fortune-telling methods that we might be most familiar with are palm reading, the reading of tea leaves, tarot cards, and perhaps even the crystal ball. However, there is a near uncountable number of ways that people have used to try and see the future. Some of the lesser-known fortune-telling methods include... Electromancy, which is where a fortune teller would attempt to see the future by observing a rooster pecking at grain. There's also ecstasy, which is where a fortune teller would attempt to see the future by observing animal, or even sometimes human, entrails. For aspiring fortune tellers who are averse to gore, there's naviology, which is where a fortune teller attempts to see an individual's future by observing their moles, freckles, and birthmarks. Or, my personal favorite, parrot astrology, which is where a parrot or parakeet picks cards from a special fortune-telling deck, and then a fortune-teller would interpret their choices. And those are just the ways that people have developed to attempt to see into the future. Divine prophecy is a foundational tenet in most major world religions. In seemingly every holy text, there are moments where the divine imbues us squishy mortals with a vision of things to come, for one reason or another. Whether it's a voice from the heavens or the random inclinations of a parakeet, one thing is consistent. Fortune-telling is a fundamental part of being a human, whether you subscribe to it or not. Even if there is no holy prophecy you believe in or superstitious practice that you're curious about, the fact remains that the fear of the future and the desire to understand it permeates all of humanity. So it's natural to ask, why? Why do we care so much? And why do we spend so much effort trying to see into the future? We are scared of what we're vulnerable to. We fear the darkness because our human eyes make us easy prey when there's no light around. We fear snakes and spiders because our fleshy bodies can succumb to their venom. And we fear the future because no matter what, we cannot control it. We are completely vulnerable to the future. I mean, I think I know what will happen today, but the truth is... I might not even finish this episode. We can make plans and be responsible, but in the end, the future and the events therein are beyond our control. In the vast lineage of fortune tellers, though, there was one man who sought to scientifically prove his ability to see into the future. However, he instead proved that we might not even know what the present is. John William Dunn was born in a British army encampment in Scotland on the 2nd of December, 1875. His childhood was pretty normal for a while, until an accident left him injured and bedridden for years. Luckily, his family was well off enough to care for him. They hired him a nurse to assist with his recovery and supplied him with enough mental stimulation to keep him sane. It was during this time that Dunn discovered that he had a deep fondness for philosophy. Interestingly enough, a new philosophical school was developing just outside the walls of Dunn's bedroom. British idealism was just finding its footing while Dunn was restricted to that room. This new philosophical movement focused heavily on the metaphysical and argued that invisible forces like an individual's mind or spirit was the ultimate foundation of reality. This philosophy must have felt like a godsend to a young boy whose physical body had failed and whose entire existence consisted of four walls, a roof, some furniture, and whatever his mind could conjure. At the age of nine, Dunn attempted his first philosophical thought experiment. He asked his nurse 
if time was the moments like yesterday, today, and tomorrow, or was it the traveling between them that we experience as the present moment? The nurse failed to produce an answer. Something else that interested Dunn in this time of isolation. He began paying particularly close attention to his dreams. At first, it was just coincidences, a watch that stopped at exactly the same time he would eventually awake. But the closer attention he gave his dreams, the more severe his predictions. A factory fire in Paris, the derailing of a train in Scotland, and most curiously, when he was 13, he dreamt of a flying machine 20 years before the Wright brothers found liftoff. J.W. Dunn believed that his dreams told him the future, and he would spend most of his life trying to figure out why. When he was able enough to get out of bed and get his body in shape, he enlisted in the military to follow in his father's footsteps. He was immediately sent to South Africa to fight in the Second Boer War. However, upon arrival, Dunn caught typhoid fever and was medically discharged. Two years after being sent home, he enlisted again, and once again, he fell ill upon arrival in South Africa. He was diagnosed with a heart condition that would restrict him from actively serving in the army for the rest of his life. Despite being unable to serve physically, he dedicated his very bright mind to the British military. While on sick leave, Dunn began working in the aeronautics department, operating in secret out of a balloon factory in South Farnborough. It was under this veil of secrecy that Dunn produced a number of prototypes. These designs ranged from manned gliders to fully functional aircraft. His first prototype was built in 1907, the Dunn D-1. It was a biplane which was first flown as a glider, and then a powered version was built, but was damaged on its first attempt at takeoff. Over the next seven years, he would build 11 more prototypes, some immediately destroyed upon first attempt and abandoned, while others found commercial success. For example, there was the Dunn D-8, which was built in 1912. Several models were built, and it was capable of flying from the UK to Paris. Another iteration of the Dunn D-8, called the Burgess Dunn, was actually adopted by the U.S. and Canadian military by 1913. While his designs were revolutionary and found some commercial and military success, by 1913 Dunn's health had declined enough that he was unable to further pursue flight. He turned his energy towards two things that his body could handle, fishing and philosophy. In 1924, Dunn published a book called Sunshine and the Dry Fly, which was an extensive treatise on the art of fly fishing. It explored the biological functions of trout's eyes and the responsiveness of trout to various kinds of lures. The book also offered readers detailed instructions to crafting fly fishing lures the J.W. Dunn way, which was highly meticulous and required fishermen to color and oil each fiber of the lure individually as to ensure top quality. In fact, Dunn's lures were so good that they continued to be manufactured until 1966, long after his death. During this time, Dunn also returned to philosophical work. Specifically, he went back to the things that fascinated him as a child, dreams and time. But before we get to his thoughts on dreams and time, we need to pause for about one minute to hear from some sponsors. Dunn's first book on the subject is called An Experiment with Time and was published in 1927. The first half of the book describes a number of precognitive dreams, most of which Dunn himself had experienced. His key conclusion was that such precognitive visions foresee future personal experiences by the dreamer, and not more general events. The second half develops a theory to try to explain them. Dunn's starting point is the observation that the moment of now is not described by science. Contemporary science described physical time as a fourth dimension, and Dunn's argument led to an endless sequence of higher dimensions of time to try and measure our passage through the dimensions below. Accompanying each level was a higher level of consciousness. At the end of the chain was a supreme, ultimate observer. According to Dunn, our wakeful attention prevents us from seeing beyond the present moment. 
whilst when dreaming that attention fades and we gain the ability to recall more of our timeline. This allows fragments of our future to appear in precognitive dreams mixed in with fragments of our memories and our past. Other experiences explained by Dunn's theory of infinite regression include déjà vu and the existence of life after death. Dunn attempted to explain this phenomenon with a philosophy that he called serialism. Serialism posits that time is constant. In serialism, there is no past or present or future. There is merely existence, and our consciousness is only capable of experiencing a portion of that existence. However, higher consciousnesses could see more of the time at once. Dunn argued that this process repeats until the only consciousness left is that of God. Because this is a very highly complex metaphysical theory, I'm going to read some interesting excerpts from a website dedicated to J.W. Dunn called Steel Pillow. They say, Dunn saw no reason why an individual mind should cease to exist in its higher levels of time, simply because the brain had died at the physical level. Quite the reverse. Once liberated from the attention-grabbing physical brain, such minds would be able to communicate with each other more freely. We would once again meet our nearest and dearest in eternity. As we continued to gain in knowledge and wisdom, our attention would span higher and higher dimensions. His seemingly endless regression of consciousness led him to terminate the series at infinity, with a universal mind representing the mental fusion of all humanity throughout time. This fusion sat within a superlative general observer, the fount of all consciousness. Dunn was a committed Christian, and the identification of God and Christ within this picture was obvious. Indeed, he felt that the message of immortality and God was by far the most important aspect of the whole thing to him. His work with serialism was met with some criticism, but it wasn't completely dismissed. You see, serialism, in J.W. Dunn's work in general, has a pretty complicated legacy. While his theory is messy and flawed, so are many of the other theories that try to quantify what time is and how we experience it. Steel Pillow has a wonderful breakdown of how Dunn's serialism holds up today. They say, There is no simple answer, as Dunn incorporated so many ideas, any of which might be true while others are not. And a good many remain highly contentious to this day. For example, Infinite regresses are just not acceptable in reality. They may appear as calculating devices where they make the maths tractable. However, they continue to plague modern physics, and no theoretician can dismiss serialism on such grounds alone. Dunn's interpretation of quantum theory nowadays, referred to as local realism, was shared at the time by some eminent contemporaries, such as Heisenberg and Einstein, but has since been discarded. However, there is no reason why we could not apply our modern understanding of it to serialism. Dunn's mathematical representations of relativity and quantum mechanics were otherwise hopelessly simplistic and flawed. His use of them to support serialism is equally flawed, though this does not prove that serialism itself is as flawed as his scientific arguments for it. While Dunn's acceptance of a brain signal corresponding to every thought remains current, he offers no valid physical mechanism by which disembodied actors might influence such brain signals. However, subsequent developments in non-local quantum phenomena, such as entanglement or even David Baum's implicit order, might conceivably fill that gap. Dunn's acceptance of a more or less atomic soul with memories remaining coherent and identifiable even after its separation from the brain, which stored the personality and memories, was never sensibly addressed and lacks any kind of rational underpinning. While this does not disprove serialism, it is questionable whether such a metaphysical concept is falsifiable, and therefore whether serialism can have any genuine relevance or meaning as a theory of reality. Nevertheless, life after death is widely believed in. Though An Experiment in Time was his most famous book, Dunn continued writing on the subject for most of his life. His final book is titled Intrusions. It discussed the presence of angelic religious sorts of dreams that interrupted his scientific work. He intentionally left these experiences out of his work with serialism as to not come off as a complete religious crackpot. In the end, Dunn never really proved that he could see the future in his dreams. In fact, 
Rather than prove that he could see the future, he instead questioned the very nature of time. Is there a future if we can't even properly define the present? If I'm dwelling on the past with a high level of concentration, does it then become the present? These are questions that philosophers and physicists still cannot provide a solid answer for. Perhaps this is why I lean towards the absurdists like Albert Camus, because when presented with the possibility that we might not ever really know what the future holds, Camus simply says, true generosity towards the future consists in giving everything to the present. And that's something I can do, even if I can't philosophically define what now is. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. I sincerely appreciate you all a ton. I hope that you're enjoying the new structure of the show and the return to weekly episodes. I know that I am enjoying a little bit more free time now that my bachelor's is pretty much finished up. I mean, I've still got a couple of classes to take over the summer, but they're going to be a piece of cake. And as for what happens next, well, if only I could see the future. I am very excited to share the indie music feature with you this week. The song is called Frayed, the artist is called Shay, and the album is called Lost In It. Why did I say it all weird like that? Because you might have to search all of those terms to find it on your favorite streaming service. It is a little bit tricky to find, but it's worth the search. Shay blends this really unique mixture of singer-songwriter folk with jazz and even some sort of like neoclassical chamber pop woodwind work. It's a real treat, and I seriously encourage you to check it out today. If you want your music featured on an episode of the show, email obscurehistorypod at gmail.com or, me, or, <laughs> or DM me, it's kind of a mouthful, or DM me on Instagram at obscurehistorypod. I'm still using the All the People Pod socials for now, but that is going to change in the near future, so if you want to keep up with this show, make sure that you find Obscure History on your favorite social networking site, except for Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> I know I set you up for that, but uh, I am I hate social media, and until I can hire an assistant, which will probably never happen, uh, I am pairing back the ones that I spend my time on because I don't like social media, even for myself. And so doing it for the show is a little tricky, even though I do love um, interacting with you guys. So if you have questions, comments, want to uh, maybe send me a message insulting my existence, all of these things are fine. I'll read them and I'll probably reply. <laughs> okay guys uh i don't even know there's a bunch of stuff i'm supposed to say uh share the show with your friends tell them about it uh steal their phones and subscribe f for them uh d d yeah all that i don't know oh rate it review it it's weird how much that helps i know that like everybody that makes content says that but like um like especially apple's like really weird about their algorithm so like the amount of plays that you get doesn't necessarily bump you up the chart, but if you get a bunch of reviews in a short amount of time, plus downloads, it's like they've got some sort of secret like formula that they use to decide who gets the publicity. Um, when I first got featured on New and Noteworthy, I got a bunch of reviews like all within a week and like a bunch of downloads like immediately, and uh, it was pretty pretty crazy. We actually shot up to number one on the history charts in the US and Canada and like some other countries. And I'm pretty sure we could jump back up into the top 25 if you guys all decided to rate and review at once. So if you feel like it, that's fine. If not, that's also fine. Uh, I'm just very thankful that so much of you, so many of you guys like stuck around after finding this show, however you found it. Anyways, I gotta get going. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later. I should stop Loving you today. It's time I thought of another way to make it through. Tangled as we are.
Loving 